Welcome to Monday Night Reading. We've got a little bit of a different night tonight. As you can see, I am going to be your host. Um, unfortunately, AJ contracted COVID this weekend, but I'll be subbing in for her. And um, we're both theater kids, so we know that the show must go on. So let me give you a little background on Monday Night Reading. AJ started Monday Night Reading a few years ago for nonfiction authors to experience the fun of reading these beautifully crafted stories that they've worked so hard on and get to experience the joy of reading it to an audience, just like fiction authors get to do. So we'd love it throughout the course of this hour if you would share any phrases that speak to you, that move you, that heck, make you laugh. There's going to be a bunch of those, by the way. Um, and note that here in top three, we do not criticize, we only uplift. We'll have some alums, I'm sure, that are going to show you the way in the chat. It ends up becoming a nice little gift for the readers that they get to see what really resonated with each of you. So feel free to use that chat liberally. Now, each month we highlight one of AJ's alums as their books publish, and 2024 is going to be a bumper crop. So far, we have 13 authors that will be publishing and getting to share their stories with you here in Monday Night Reading. Many of them are publishing their first, or in John Briggs' case, their second books. So that's a perfect segue for me to introduce tonight's author, John Briggs. John Briggs, would you like to say hello to the crowd? Hello, crowd. <laughs> And I can't see everybody that's here, but I feel like you've got a pretty good group of folks that are showing up to support you. I love that. So John uh, happens to be top three's very first author to publish. And you're back again with another terrific book. Um, if you would, John, allow me to give a proper introduction to everybody as they roll in. So John Briggs is not just known for his expressive t-shirts and zooming in from a folding chair as you've upgraded your chairs, but for going against big four accounting firms with his new workday normal rock star business culture and jaw dropping quarterly revenue increases of 492%. But how did he do it? Many people have been dying to know John's secrets, but fear not, because he recently put all of this stellar business advice from epic failures to his greatest successes into his new book, The 3.3 Rule, A New Workday Normal. Through his 12 plus years of entrepreneurship, he has learned that achieving a highly profitable business can be overwhelming, particularly with all the barriers and unknowns that new business owners are forced to deal with. Entrepreneurs can quickly become stressed out and often sadly give up on the mission that they set out for because of burnout. In much the same way that the body needs blood to survive, our economy needs small businesses, the lifeblood of the economy, in order to stay healthy and to grow more resilient. John Briggs is a man on a mission, a mission to give entrepreneurs a new workday standard so they avoid burnout and stay in business by learning how to make more by working less. He walks the walk by battling against traditional CPA culture of overwork, underpay, pay your dues and suffer while you're at it mentality by providing his team with the same new workday normal, even during busy tax season. And he, his wife and their four children live in Utah because that's where they make fry sauce. Right. Uh, <laughs> and it makes the inversion worth it this time of year, right, John? Yep. So we have um, a fabulous new team member, Shade, who's going to be sharing some links in the chat for how you can stay connected to John and also uh, get copies of his fantastic book. But first, John, I want to share a message that AJ texted me from her sick bed. She said to tell you, John, I am so proud of you. Your book is excellent. You've grown so much as a writer and it shows on every page. It's my honor to help you bring two game-changing books into the world. I'm so sorry I can't be with you tonight, enjoying your dry wit and deep passion for making a difference for your readers. And folks, if it fits your budget, please buy John's book. Now, John, uh, would you please share your book fundamentals with everybody, aka who are you writing for? Yeah, so my book is for business owners who want to fix the demand of nonstop work for themselves and their team. Um, the core message is the most efficient workday consists of working up to three hours at a time, followed by a 30% recovery period. And the promise, if you take the book to heart, you'll extinguish burnout, regain control, and uh, create an intolerance of unconscionable overtime work hours in your life. 
Okay, folks, raise your hand if uh, that sounds like a book that you or somebody that you know needs, right? This is some good stuff. And it's just so timely. It's just so perfectly on the cusp of what everybody I think is feeling and trying to get some relief for. So I'm thrilled that you've got this out. Um, okay, so your first story, do you have any, do we need to be set up for what it is that you're going to be sharing with us? Um, this was effectively the manifesto um, that kind of set me on this journey of writing the second book. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know if that's enough of a setup. I think that's great. All right. You know what? I'm going to zip my lip and let you take it away with your fantastic intro. Okay. Here I go. I needed to write this book. Don't confuse that with wanting to write it. For me, writing a book is a Herculean task that takes years of drafting and mind-numbing research, all while running a multi-million dollar firm with more than 60 team members. We actually have uh, more than 100 at today's date. Um, I published my first book, Profit First for Micro Gyms, in 2020. It was way more work than I could ever have imagined. Even though it is a book for a niche market that takes the concepts from Profit First by Mike Michalowicz, and applies them to the fitness industry. I was extremely proud that I did it, but I had zero intention of torturing myself again by writing another book. Well, this book exists. Why did I need to do this? I saw a problem that wasn't being addressed and felt called to address it, regardless of my initial resistance. It started when one of my best employees quit. As we raced toward the April 15 tax filing deadline, the team members in my tax practice can go through moments of stress. Brent was stressed most of the time. On top of his responsibilities at work, he had three young children who required a lot of parenting effort. And his wife was very overwhelmed having recently given birth to their third child. Brent wanted to be there for her as much as possible. We supported him in that. He worked fewer hours during that tax season than any other in his entire career, but his stress didn't go away. At the end of tax season, he still longed to provide more of the support his wife needed. To do that, he thought he needed to leave public accounting. Brent averaged 45 hours a week during tax season and felt that another full-time job in a different industry was the answer, even though a new job in a new industry would likely require him to work the same number of hours. Brent's previous years of accounting experience had conditioned him to believe that being in the industry would take away the freedom he needed to support his wife, even though the reality of his, ex of his experience with our firm was that he didn't have to sacrifice his life for work. He couldn't overcome the feeling that he did. His predicament broke my heart. Many Brents are the casualties of broken industries, that push a requirement to work unconscionable hours and a perception that it is necessary to never take breaks. Very sharp minds, great people who deliver exceptional services are self-selecting out of this abusive relationship with their employers. For accounting firms, the existing data is alarming. Accounting programs are seeing lower and lower enrollments with 68% of accountants leaving public accounting within their first five years. The accounting industry won't be able to rely on new, unsuspecting graduates to staff this massive turnover. Being a CPA gives me intimate insight into my clients and our industry, but this retention problem doesn't just affect the accounting industry. Law firms, software companies, product development companies, and any companies that continue to demand outrageous hours from their teams run the same risks of increased turnover and fewer new workers. My initial solution for these broken industries was simple and perhaps naive. If companies just cared for their team members and team members cared about their companies and clients, all the bad stuff would work itself out. Except it wasn't that simple. The leaders of the companies that are the biggest culprits when it comes to abusing their team with immoral overtime hours don't spend each day figuring out how to be a-holes to their employees. If asked, do you care about your team? They would likely respond in the affirmative. They aren't uncaring on purpose, but they aren't caring on purpose either. Many leaders who seem not to care don't have time to show their teams that they do. 
They work a full capacity. They work at full capacity during every waking moment. They get a jump start on their work days by checking email during breakfast. They work through lunch, don't come home for dinner, and usually feel the need to do 17 things at a time. Their on switch are never turned off. An act of purposeful caring requires attention and conscious effort, which aren't possible when working in these conditions. CEOs in the U.S. work an average of 10 to 11 hours a day, while employees work an average of 47 hours per week, with almost 40% of all workers hitting 50 hours or more each week. Some business owners have said to me, stop faulting them, John. What's wrong with them wanting to make more money to improve their quality of life? Nothing. Most CEOs are on salary, though, and won't receive more compensation for working more hours. Chances are, if their quality of life at a base CEO salary, plus stock options and performance bonuses, doesn't give them happiness, more money isn't going to solve that. If CEOs and team members are on one side of the coin, companies are on the other. Some companies want to make more money, too. The salary cost of a team member is usually a fixed amount each month. The more hours they work, the higher the margin of the value created for the company. If a CEO earns a performance bonus, the company has already calculated that cost into the gain. The company is happy to pay the CEO's bonus because it means the company had the financial outcome it wanted. While we have morbidly created a myth that being busy is a sign of worth, the team member putting in long hours isn't usually thinking, I'm happy to do this because it's really going to benefit me. They're usually thinking, if I don't do this, I'm going to be fired, which could very well be true. Greed is another factor in forcing people to work ridiculous hours. At this point, however, it's more a matter of how Americans have been conditioned. It's easy to see how shareholder greed gets passed down through the bureaucratic layers of large corporations, dehumanizing the workers by treating them like another asset to be leveraged. But small business owners are doing the same thing, even if only to themselves. Where corporations abuse teams out of greed, small business owners do it for the sake of survival. They need the work to be done so they can get the revenue to pay the bills they can barely afford. Once upon a very stressful time, that was me. Until I created a system that allowed for the caring leadership that I wanted to provide my team. I tested the system, tweaked it, tested it again and again until it worked. I call it the 3.3 rule, and I'll explain why in the pages to come. CPAs at my firm now average 42 hours a week during tax season, while other CPAs work a minimum of 55 hours. This gives the team time to breathe and think about other things, like improvement, instead of feeling like they have to go, 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 and then go some more. It gives management the space to provide feedback and mentoring instead of being forced to act like jockeys whipping horses into action. It gives the entire team the ability to care on purpose. Quality of work improves, retention of clients increases, and turnover of team members decreases. All of this improves my company's bottom line. I was content with the changes I made within my firm. They improved my team's quality of life and my own. And then I thought about all the small accounting firms closing up shop. I thought about all the good people and terrible jobs across many industries who are expected to trade their lives for work. I thought about Brent, who had bought into the belief that long hours were a requirement of an industry and so could not see an alternative to quitting it altogether. And that is why I felt compelled to write this book, even though I didn't want to write another book. This book shows the nuts and bolts, rubber meets the road, easily applicable method that my company uses internally and has taught other business owners to do. It shows how we care for our team and clients. Although all business owners probably feel like they care for their teams, the systems, processes, and methods in this book don't exist in many of their businesses. We need to recondition ourselves to this better model the 3.3 rule. If we have a work addiction, we need to get sober and we need to create businesses that encourage anything other than workaholism. Being busy shouldn't be a badge of honor. Instead, the new badge of honor is granting yourself and your team the ability to have a life outside of work. 
We need to extinguish burnout, regain control, and create an intolerance for unconscionable overtime hours. Religious leader David O. McKay said, no amount of success can compensate for failure in the home. That home can include a spouse and kids, just you and your kids, just you and a spouse, only you, or any other configuration. The point is that no one gets the gets to the end of this life regretting not making employee of the month or putting in more hours at work. Now, I'm not encouraging entitlement or laziness. Hard work is still required, but hard work isn't the same as excessive work. Be focused and efficient at work, then take time to have a life. The 1998 Pixar films A Bug's Life shares an applicable lesson. Hopper, the villain, the villain of the film, explains to his crew that they will be in big trouble if the ants they are bullying ever realize that they outnumber the grasshoppers. It is common for ants to provide some food to grasshoppers in exchange for the grasshoppers' protection of the ants. Hopper and his gang twist the natural cycle by bullying the ants to provide them with ample food so they will not be abused by the grasshoppers themselves. What a deal. Hey, we'll give you some protection protection from us. This is similar to what you see in the movies when the mob forces store owners on their turf to pay them for protection. The ants, of course, are terrified of Hopper. That fear pushes them to gather food, not only for themselves, but also extra for the grasshoppers. Gathering their own food would only require standard work days, but the grasshoppers have them working nonstop. A business model that pushes nonstop work and countless overtime hours is absurd. While the ants did the grasshoppers bidding, the ants resented and hated the grasshoppers and arguably themselves because of it. In our lives, who are the grasshoppers? When I was at Deloitte, it was management and the entire traditional firm structure. When I started my own business, I was the grasshopper, even though I was also the ant. Demanding overtime hours and nonstop work makes us grasshoppers, even if that demand is just on us. We need to say goodbye to the currently accepted and tolerated model of the eight-hour workday. Businesses can grow and thrive with a new business model that focuses on team members working no longer than three hours at a time, followed by a break of no less than 30% of the time worked. The 3.3 rule is a solution for us and our teams the fix for work-life imbalance and countless overtime hours. It's a solution that extinguishes burnout, allows us to regain our control, and creates a cultural intolerance for overtime hours, leaving all to feel optimistic, hopeful, and happy. I want to see a world where business owners aren't struggling or finding themselves in dark places due to negative stress or fear of ruining their businesses, waiting for the other shoe to drop. I want business owners to have relationships with their spouses children, and loved ones that aren't dictated by the needs of their businesses 24-7. Rather than feel imprisoned by work, they should experience the full range of things this life was designed to provide. People, including business owners, should not be asked to sacrifice family time on a regular basis. I want to see companies design work environments where employees enjoy freedom similar to those of the business owners, where teams aren't overworked and have time for their lives. I want business owners to enjoy profitability, financial freedom, and time to build healthy relationships with all the important people in their lives. I want them to feel like they've never been happier because ultimately we create our businesses so we can be happy. Absolutely outstanding. Fantastic. I mean, it feels revolutionary. It really does, John. Um, so in your introduction, you said... <laughs> You said you did not want to write a second book, and I know this is true, um, but you felt compelled to do so. Would you say a little bit more about why it was so important to you to tackle another book? Yeah. Um, I mean, we I don't know how deep you want to go, but it, I believe that our U.S. economy, um, which is, of all the world economies, is the most important to me. <laughs> uh our U.S. economy is built on the back of small business. And I think about the small business owner. I've been a CPA for 15 years. I've met a lot, thousands. Um, and I know that the majority of them are just trying their darndest and they're putting a lot of energy 
with very little to show for it. So then I think about the small business owner, and then I look at the statistics of what my industry is doing to accountants, which small business owners, in my opinion, need. Um, we have, I shared those statistics. Those haven't changed. Uh, accountants are leaving within three to five years, um, knowing, because the model is, let me squeeze every last ounce of soul out of you. And then I know that you're going to jump ship because the headhunters are going to call you and you're going to be like, that sounds way better. Yet now because of social media, which is great, um, people are open and share their experiences, their bad experiences as an accountant. And so potential accountants can be like, what major should I choose? And they see all these things on Reddit and Glassdoor. It's like this, that's terrible. Uh, maybe there's a different way to the path, that, like where I actually want to end up going. Um, so you combine all those things. And if this trend continues for accountants, you're going to have fewer accountants. So then you think about supply and demand, which means they're going to raise their prices and they're going to outprice themselves from being able to serve the small business owner. They're not going to be able to hire them. And I know a business owners need accountants to help them with their financials. So then what's going to happen? There, another solution is going to have to exist that is likely not going to have the same skill set that an accountant can offer. So we're, we're going to run the risk that small business owners aren't going to be supported. Therefore, they're going to go out of business and our economy eventually crashes all because we've allowed this. This is the way it is to exist for so long. Like people just accept it. I mean, I remember like my accounting professors, it's just what they taught us is this is how you live. You'll accept it. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> So you all are getting a little taste of the passion that um, we observed in a live edit uh, several months ago when you were still trying to work on this manuscript and figure out what actually needed to go into it. And I remember you being very unhappy because you just didn't want to write another book, but also because it didn't it it didn't have this passion in it. And AJ said what is your manifesto and that became the introduction to this fantastic book how did it feel to tap into this this knowledge that you have and to put pen to paper um i mean the first thought that comes to mind when you say that is i i nowadays with social media i think sometimes passion unfiltered is dangerous um, and a lot of times that passion is shared with lack of understanding on wherever the words are directed, right? We've all read the comments on social media sometimes thinking like, wow, that's super mean to say. Um, and so obviously I have a disdain for the accounting industry who have forced us through this thing, but you know, like unfiltered, I could probably say some things out of context um, I could say things maybe too harshly so that maybe they're not received the way I want them to. So being able to put pen to paper allowed me to think through, especially the way AJ teaches us as authors, to think through well, what would the arguments be? So I could add the context in um, so that I feel like my passion, energy in the manifesto comes across in a way that's respectful while also showing that there's got to be a better way. And so maybe those who need to hear, and it's not just accounting firms, maybe some of the other cor people who lead corporations will receive the message the way I intended it to be, which is to help the world, not just make them feel bad for, you know, doing what they're doing to people. Yeah, I definitely think that this book is um, far, has a much broader audience than um, just accountants. I think um, a lot of, um, this you, it, this has broad strokes that that can apply to a lot of different businesses, and um, we've already had some people in the chat say that it's just like the absolute perfect time. Um, you have a selection from chapter one that you're going to share with us, right? Yes. All right, take it away. Okay. You look like the hunchback of Notre Dame. Your hands feel twice as heavy, and they drag your arms down and pull your shoulders forward. Your leg muscles ache with fatigue and you fear your knees will give out at any moment. You wonder if someone made the soles of your shoes out of cement. You can't pick up your feet, so you shuffle instead. 
If someone saw you coming, they would easily mistake you for zombie, a quasi-moto zombie. This isn't a description of how you feel after a long, hard workout. This is you leading work at the end of the day. Running a business can be hard. You're doing everything you can to be successful or maybe just to stay afloat, and you are exhausted. You have dark bags under your eyes, and they feel swollen and dry. You're carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. Some days you lack the energy to even lift your head, and it gets worse. Your team feels the same way. The rat race, they call it, but it hardly feels like a race at all. Comparing it to a rat on a wheel is an injustice, for at least that little creature is in motion. You, on the other hand, feel trapped and drained, yet you keep moving, striving to keep up, and somehow convince yourself that you are winning. This is how I felt at the end of my time with Deloitte, a big four accounting firm, and during the early years of growing my own firm. The amount of overtime we require of ourselves and our teams is oppressive, and it's detrimental to our health, wealth, and happiness. We need a better solution. I remember how the days blurred together when I was working more than 70 hours a week. I would wake up before anyone else in the house, get ready for work, get into my rust bucket, think about work while driving to work, and then fill my entire day with work, work, and more work. As the day progressed, mental fatigue decreased the quality of my work. Then the mid-afternoon munchies hit, so I'd go on the hunt for something to snack on. Hello, Mr. Vending Machine, aren't you looking divine today? Giving the sugar five minutes to kick in, I'd try to work some more, but tasks took longer than they should have. Yet another wet blanket on my mood. Finally, it would be time for dinner break. I'd allow myself a whopping 10-minute break to stuff my face as fast as I could swallow since chewing took too much time. Yum. Then back to work again, followed by more. What's that word again? Work. How about even more after that? Long after sunset, I'd find myself staring at something on my screen far too long. But instead of taking that as a sign that I should go home, I'd commit to getting one last thing done, then I'd drive home, tiptoe through my house so I didn't wake up my wife, spend three minutes winding down, and collapse into bed. And that was just a typical Saturday. Most business owners are optimists, or we wouldn't, or we wouldn't have started our businesses in the first place. We keep holding out for that big payoff. We power through the physical and mental exhaustion of the work week, the seven day work week. We view our mental, physical, and emotional fatigue as a sacrifice. We are convinced that we'll find the holy grail of a perfect life at the end of the journey. Someday we'll have the business success we want, the compensation we want, the free time we want. Money will no longer be the dominant factor in our decision-making. We'll watch our favorite game show. And while drinking our beverages of choice, and laugh at the $50,000 grand prize. I make that in a month, we'll say to ourselves. We'll take tons and tons of vacation. We'll finally get to see our children grow up while experiencing amazing things with them and building memories that each of us will cherish forever. We'll enjoy evening time with our family, eating dinner, playing board games, watching movies, doing 5,000 piece puzzles, and tucking our kids into bed. Good night, John boy. We'll even make time for our health no longer chained to work, we will finally be in control of our lives. We want that holy grail for our teams too. We think that the long hours are temporary and that our talented employees will be rewarded in the end. We ignore the red flags that warn us this is no way to live, holding out for the win, until we start to lose our health, our relationships, our best employees. Something's gotta give. Jump to the next section of this. How I became human again. When I started my firm, I hustled and ground my way to becoming a zombie. 80 hour weeks were the norm with occasional 110 hour weeks. I kept adding new clients and I got to the point where I had to hire help. As my firm grew, I didn't just keep eating brains. I also started feeding brains to my team. I was leading them down the same hustle and grind zombie path that I was on. Hey, come with me. I'm too busy to realize my life is miserable. Want to join me? I lived with the unceasing anxiety that I would find myself in a situation where there was enough cash to pay either my team or myself, but not both. As my team grew, the guilt of creating brain addicts got to me and I wanted to shield my team from zombification as much as possible. But my zombie dumb continued. 
My home life consisted of limited interactions with my kids in the middle of the night when they woke up and I was trying to rock them back to sleep. There were piles of fast food, trash, and junk food wrappers in my office garbage can, and that diet led to rapid weight gain. And I kept my zombie shuffle looking like a beat down boxer after facing Mike Tyson pre or post ear bite. In short, I was stressed, fatigued, and unhappy. Serendipity happened. To get my CPA license, I needed to join a group that could sign off as supervisors of my required hours worked. And it just so happened that they offered me some admin and base level accounting support. This freed up enough of my time that I wasn't working nonstop. I had sufficient breaks during the day. It was nice. I didn't need as many brains to curb my zombie appetite. I was home more often for dinner during tax season. I had time to deepen client relationships, which made finding new ones easier and existing client loyalty stronger. Unfortunately, this was an accidental discovery, and I didn't realize at the time that I had witnessed a glimpse of a better model. For some time, I went back to my old ways of eating brains and working long hours. It will eventually work out, I would tell myself. I'm doing what everyone else does. Herd mentality will work out. This is the way. I'm not that tired. Can I get a double serving of brains for lunch? I'm doing this for my kids' future. And the BS continued vomiting in my thoughts. I knew I had to offer a path so my team could graduate from the big four approach into a higher way of life, a way of life that rewarded good results, not quantity of hours with time, flexibility, happiness, and overall life satisfaction, brain free, of course. But how? The turning point came during an interview process for a new accountant. I found myself in the fortunate situation of having two great candidates to choose from. My wife and I, made some personal sacrifices and found the money to hire both. This spread out the workload, which allowed both new hires and me enough work, responsibilities, and adequate breaks. We all had enough capacity to do our work and live our lives. When the dots connected, I realized that the times I wasn't stressed out from work were when I was intentional about working and taking breaks. That's when I did my best work for clients. The company's growth was healthy, my team executed at the highest level, our entire company's happiness and joy were greatest, and I could be fully present at home with my family. This reminded me of how we worked where I grew up. My family lived in Missouri for a, a, a time, and my dad had a couple of hay fields. He would use each field for three years and then rest the field for a year. It also reminded me of how we hope our work week allows us to take time off on the weekend. Two weekend days out of the full week equals 30% non-work time. Resting fields and taking two days off during the week are healthy cycles. Then I thought about how our bodies have cycles too. Eat food and it will eventually cycle out of your digestive system. You know, poop. Drink water and, and around two hours later, you will pee. We wake up and then sleep. Eight hours of sleep is 33% of the day. Finally, I tried this cycle in my business, three hours of work max, followed by 30% recovery time. This is what I discovered when I was intentional about working blocks and taking breaks. All these experiences and reflections led me to create the 3.3 rule, which I get into in detail in chapter two. But here's the gist. The most efficient workday consists of up to three hour work blocks, the first three in the 3.3 rule, followed by 30% recovery periods, the 0.3 in the 3.3 rule. That's it. That's the way forward. The 3.3 rule fixes the demand for nonstop work, prevents burnout, and creates an intolerance for unconscionable overtime hours. This method does not impede growth. In fact, businesses can grow and thrive with this new workday standard. It worked for my business, which has seen 492% growth since I implemented the 3.3 rule, and it works for the businesses I consult with. The benefits of the 3.3 rule are not exclusive to the accounting industry. You'll find that you and your team will experience similar benefits. When teams adopt this new workday standard, the company can handle crises better and without letting the quality of work suffer because everyone has some extra bandwidth to step in. Owners have time to go above and beyond in caring for their teams. Teams feel more cared for, less stressed, and therefore healthier, which helps with retaining great talented team members. Clients enjoy dealing with happier teams, which helps client retention, 
a very important component to business growth. The path to get to the 3.3 rule may feel like hard work because it will require you to change some things. But don't mistake the feeling of hard work for the same thing as hustle and grind. Obstacles will come up as you work through the process, and this book helps you navigate them. By the end of this book, you will be able to free yourself and your team from work-life imbalance and countless overtime hours. You and your team will experience an improved quality of work, healthy growth, a greater ability to be fully present outside of work, and increased happiness. I've tested countless fixes. Some even offered short-term benefits. However, one worked every time and for the long term, the 3.3 rule. It very well might be the only solution to reversing the trend of burnout. This is our lifeline, our antidote to the zombie life. Outstanding. I One thing that jumps out to me about this whole concept of the 3.3 rule is that the unconscionable hours that you're talking about makes it a, an issue of morality, right? And, that, and to challenge business owners to have a more um, ethical and human point of view with their workforce. It's... It's really terrific stuff, John. Um, when you talk about unconscionable hours, how is working those um, a sign that your business might be in trouble? Yeah. Or well, not working as well as it could. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, if you think about that business owner who's working that long, you ask, why are they putting in so many hours? Uh, well, likely they need to pay the bills, whether that's themselves or their personal life. Okay, so how do you pay bills? You need clients to pay you money. So how do I get clients to pay me money? I need to do the work. Um, so one thing that comes to mind, uh, if I have a gallon of jug, I'll show you my my glass jar here. I, this is how I track my water intake every day. Um, it's a gallon. If I have that gallon jug and I have two gallons of honey and I start pouring it in, um, you know, it's not all going to fit, but oftentimes business owners don't stop to think about how big of a gallon of capacity can my service offer right now. All they think is I got to pay bills. I got to pay bills. And that could be because I'm not profitable enough. It could be because I'm not paying my client, uh, my, I'm not charging enough. Um, it could be my team members not effective enough. My processes could be bad, but there's lots of reasons but ultimately the symptom of all those reasons is you're putting in all these long hours because you think that's the only solution to get the client to pay you so you can have the money to do whatever you need to do with that money. And then rinse, lather, repeat, and then zombification. Yeah. 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 So in your book, you not only explain how to implement the 3.3 rule, but you also go into detail about how to improve nearly every aspect of uh, your business to accommodate this change. Um, can you talk some more about some of the improvements readers can make in order to benefit? Yeah. So there's a 3.3 rule, which should make everyone more efficient based on the science I talk about in the book. But then I add into it the 3.3 system, which is how do I make each work focus time even more productive? Um, I've kind of already alluded to them in my last response, but capacity is a big thing. Um, if you have you and your team are working so many hours and you don't give yourself extra space, then anytime anything unplanned happens, which never of course happens in small business, uh, you're already setting yourself up for failure because you don't have the capacity or bandwidth to even get it done. Um, another concept we talk about is the team multiplier, like paying attention to your team production multiplier. Um, businesses need to get a return on the investment they put into their team. And if they're not doing that, then they just literally cannot stay in business. It's not sustainable mathematically. And so um, some of those, so we talk about some of those things. Sometimes clients aren't great clients. Well, you do. Uh, you should probably have a system where you're looking at the quality of clients. And if they're not great, are there some tweaks you can make to make them great? I suggest a few tweaks in the book on how you can do that. Um, so there's technically 11 things in the 3.3 system that we go into. We call it a baseline. Um, so people can actually take a baseline and determine where am I at? 
And then there's things I can do to improve that percentage so that where if I'm at 30%, I can get to a hundred percent. Um, so yeah. Okay. So let's just say, I think this all sounds great, John, but this is not for me. This isn't the right time. Uh, yeah, this is nice. Maybe I'll try and implement it down the road. What do you have to say to somebody like me? <laughs> um, I'll say, okay, yeah, it's probably not right, but here's the deal. Um, there's a lot of science that supports what I said. So I'm open to being wrong, but if you're going to, if you want me to be wrong, you got to commit to proving me wrong. So take an eight, just take one work day and do the rule because this rule you can implement tomorrow. You're going to work up to three hours, however that long that is. Like maybe there's a task I can only get an hour in before I lose focus. That means you're going to take 30% of that hour off afterwards. You want to take 20 minutes off. Follow the actual rule for one day and then give me the proof that it doesn't work. Okay, everybody, you heard the man. Challenge accepted. Let's uh, let's all commit to doing that, and then you can send um, all of your complaints to John Briggs at. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, fantastic, uh, and I, I really hope uh, everybody kind of takes that challenge on tomorrow. Um, on a personal note, I want to thank you because AJ, in be being your book developing editor throughout this process began to implement that rule. So I have a terrific work life. I love my work life, just so you know. Um, so I can I can say that it works. Um, okay, so we've got one more uh, fantastic chapter that you're gonna read for us. And this is John's call to greatness. So a call to greatness is you've done the steps, you've learned what you've needed to learn, you have a whole new mindset. And this is maybe what we didn't even realize that was on the horizon for us. So this is John's chapter seven, and I'm gonna turn it over to you, John. Okay. For the 3.3 rule to work in your business, you have to live it. I've met business owners who hear my message and say, I totally agree. And I'm doing that with my team. My team isn't working more than 40 hours a week. I then ask them how many hours they are working. Oh, well, I'm working 70 to 80 hours a week and I hate my life. Dan Sullivan, founder of Strategic Coach and author of Who Not How, The Formula to Achieve Bigger Goals Through Accelerating Teamwork, says, entrepreneurs that are always tightly overscheduled can't transform themselves. They can maximize what they are doing for short periods of time, and then they think they are really being effective. But actually, they aren't being effective at all. They're just being really busy. Busy isn't the same thing as effective. You need Slack in your system for you and your team to use the 3.3 rule. You have to have Slack in your system. That Slack will allow you the space you need to make vital decisions and take necessary actions. The Slack that Dan refers to is simply a period of time when you do not need to force yourself to work. Sounds like he's describing a 30% recovery period. Without Slack in the system, the standard outcome is for things to run over capacity. That puts stress on the system, stress in your system. Being busy will always be a temptation because the demands of life don't usually diminish, not without conscious decision-making and deliberate action, not without boundaries set around your time. Being efficient is better than being busy because you are more productive and you get things done. But efficiency's ugly tag-along cousin is busyness. Efficient people run a high risk of remaining busy because instead of saying, look what I did, they say, I can do even more now. The 3.3 rule creates boundaries for the efficient person. Confirmation bias. Change, even change attached to a strong desire like reclaiming life outside of work again, can be elusive thanks to confirmation bias. We are up against a century of the eight-hour workday, 40-hour workweek bias. Can it change? Seth Godin says, worldview is the term I use to refer to the rules, values, beliefs, and biases that an individual consumer brings to a situation. Worldviews are the reason that two intelligent people can look at the same data and walk away with completely different conclusions. It's not that they didn't have access to the data or that they have poor reasoning skills. It's simply that they had already put themselves into a particular worldview before you even ask the question. In The Crucible of Doubt, Reflections on the Quest for Faith, authors 
Carol and Fiona Givens further explain, we all inhabit geographical, linguistic, and social worlds that shape our vision and our impressions of what is normal, what is real. Our worldviews, our biases, influence the questions we ask, but they can also get in the way of asking the right questions. They continue. They can get us off on the wrong foot, obscure our line of sight, or simply misdirect our focus. This is because all too often we don't realize the limiting assumptions with which we are working. If my bias tells me that working nonstop is the only way to grow my business, any attempt I make at working less will be a failure. Confirmation bias makes it extremely difficult to see anything other than what makes us right. The University of Stanford did a study with two groups of people. One group supported capital punishment and the other was opposed to it. Both groups read two fictional studies. Each group read the same exact study. But one group was told that one study focused on the negative consequences of capital punishment, and the other one talked about the benefits, while the other group was told the exact opposite about the two studies, even though, again, they were one. Regardless, the majority of participants stuck to their original views, pointing to the data that supported it and discarding that which did not. Anti-death people, anti-death penalty people became more anti-death penalty when shown pro-death penalty evidence and vice versa. Confirmation bias makes us completely closed to any differing points of view, especially the ones communicated passionately and aggressively. Our brains want to use the least amount of energy possible, and it takes less energy to pair something we hear with what we already know. Learning something new or unlearning something takes a whole lot more energy. Naturally, then, we tend to see data that confirms what we already know or that makes us right. Each of us has some level of confirmation bias. It'd be great if hopping on one leg for 17 seconds, pinching both earlobes at the same time for three seconds, and, doing, and then doing six jumping jacks would cure confirmation bias. It doesn't. I asked my kids to try, and they are still biased in favor of my wife, who is their favorite parent. But we can overcome bias by being curious and asking more questions. Consider the opposite is a useful approach. For example, if the way it is in your industry is the acceptance of impossible work hours, you should consider the opposite. Unconscionable work hours are unacceptable. What is an alternative? You've read this far, so you, are, so you already have an answer for that. But what is the alternative for you? What if horrendous work hours are unacceptable for you? What is the alternative? It all started with a simple concept, the 3.3 rule, which has transformed not only my workday, but also the trajectory of my entire business. On August 11th, 2022, while I was finishing up a 30 minute recovery block, I received a text. I sat next to a guy named Steve on my flight who said he needs an accountant. Here's his number. Thanks, Kat, I texted back. I rarely take sales calls anymore, but Kat is special and I call the people she asks me to call. Steve and I spoke on October 15th, a tax filing extension day, notoriously busy for accountants. It was another normal day for me. Steve didn't know that. He asked, it's October 15th. Are you sure you have time to talk? We can reschedule. This time works. We have systems in place. The day isn't a stressful day. Turns out, the cat's introductory text was like a golden ticket to Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. That conversation led to a massive opportunity and partnership with Steve and his company. Prime Corporate Services helps business owners with liability protection, improving business credit, and providing tax and accounting support. Steve was looking for a firm that could fulfill the crap ton of tax and accounting services he needed. Not very many accounting firms are set up to take on 200 new clients a week, but we were. We had spent the last five years implementing the 3.3 system and creating a solid foundation that was ready for expansion, mass expansion. Now we can change the lives of many more accountants, rescuing them from the clutches of endless work. Our last few years, we have averaged 42 hours a week during tax season. You see, the 3.3 rule is more than just a strategy for productivity. It's a philosophy, a way of life that demands we challenge the status quo and redefine what it means to truly excel. It teaches us to harness the power of focused work, 
followed by intentional recovery to unlock our highest potential. But it doesn't stop there. The true application lies in the 3.3 system, the engine that propels this philosophy forward. It is through the implementation of this system that we can transform our businesses, our careers, and our lives. The 3.3 system empowers us to streamline our process, optimize our resources, and create an environment ripe for growth and expansion. Just as with my conversation with Steve on that fateful October day, opportunities are waiting to be seized by those who are prepared. They come in all shapes and sizes, sometimes disguised as challenges or obstacles. But armed with the 3.3 rule and the 3.3 system, you will be ready to embrace them with open arms. Imagine a future where your workday is not a soul-sucking grind of stress and exhaustion, but a wellspring of inspiration, fulfillment, and awesomeness. A future where you have the capacity to take on 200 new clients a week, not because you are overwhelmed, but because you have built a foundation of efficiency and excellence. This is the future that awaits you. So I ask you now with unwavering conviction, will you rise to the occasion? Will you commit to the pursuit of greatness armed with the 3.3 rule and the 3.3 system as your guiding principles? Will you 3.3 it? The choice is yours and the world eagerly awaits your answer. Let your story be the one that inspires others to challenge norms, reimagine what is possible, and create ripple effects of success. Embrace the power of the 3.3 rule and let it be the catalyst for your transformation. Together, let us embark on this journey toward a future filled with extraordinary achievements, untapped potential, and a legacy that will endure for generations to come. The time is now and greatness awaits. That is a powerful ending. And John, I just want to say, you're the man brave enough to demand that we all consider the accountants. <laughs> Won't someone think of the accountants? Um, can you share with us what change you hope to see in the world because of this book? Um, yeah, honestly, I'd, I'd like to see more people spending time at home um, because they can and because their job allows them to do it. Uh, I'm, I know the data I've, I mean, I took two years, right. From starting this to now. And, uh, it definitely supports that if business owners will give permission to their people and themselves, they can be more productive in their work life. And then, you know, spend more time at home, I, building connections, not just at home per se, but outside of work, right. Building actual connections with humans. It's as humans, it's something that we need. Even as an introvert, I can admit that we need to have connections with people. And we can't do that if we're working unconscionable hours. Love it. Love it. Stamp it. Sign me up. I'm all for it. I think it's fantastic. Um, you have on uh, your website, Shadai has um, very helpfully been sharing links with how folks can get a copy of the 3.3 rule, which comes out uh, on the 15th. Am I right? That's January right. 15th. And on your website, you also have some, uh, maybe some special deals for folks who bulk purchase who maybe buy more than one copy what's that all about yeah so if you buy um i think three is the low end but uh, we want to reward you for sharing the wealth basically because you know most people don't read three copies i give some away um they can range anywhere from some of our snarky irs sucks t-shirts to all the way up to uh you know podcasts uh you can be on a podcast with me i'll fly with you somewhere um the highest end will go to Vegas and uh, do a racing experience with some Lamborghinis. Wow. <laughs> that sounds fun. That sounds yeah. great. All right. And um, by all means, folks, if you have it in your budget to get a copy, please do so. If you don't have it in your budget, not a worry. Go ahead and let your local library put in a request with them to get a copy of this book or, you know, maybe three copies um, staying on, on theme. Um, next month, we are going to have on February 12th, another Monday night reading with a fantastic Dr. Marie Helene. Uh, who will be talking about the resiliency plan. I see there's a theme here. We are trying to change the world here at top three. John, you're a huge part of that. Thank you so much for your fantastic book, for coming back a second time and for enduring a little bit of a host change here at the helm. I've had a great conversation with you and I hope everyone else did as well. And uh, go ahead and grab a copy of John's book. I hope you have a fantastic night. Thank you, John. Thank you.
You bet. Everybody, take care. Have a great night. We'll see you soon.